or didn't use that? I'm going to talk about zippers today. No, not the kind that you'll find on your jacket. <laughs> Rather the, uh, the functional programming technique. Or data structure, or whatever you like to call it. Family of data structures might be the most accurate. What are the objectives of this talk? So hopefully, we will learn about something useful. Uh, we will highlight some important properties of functional data structures, and we will see how these zipper things can be practically applied by going through some examples from, a, from an actual library out there. Um, this, in, this is intended as a beginner to intermediate level talk. So if you consider yourself beginner to intermediate level, please ask a question. Chances are somebody else has the same question in their mind. And if you ask the question, then everybody gets to hear the answer. All right, so I encourage you to ask a question. All the examples will be in Scala. That's what I use at work. Um, it's just, <laughs> if you know Haskell and you imagine it like with lots of curly braces everywhere, and then it, the type inference doesn't work, that's Scala. <laughs> um, so with, with this functional programming thing that you may have heard about, we like to use immutable data. All right. And that gives us certain properties. So immutable data is generally easier to reason about, so we don't have crazy global variables that are changing and then altering the performance of things in other corners of the system. Right? We only have immutable data, and so we avoid those kind of problems. Um, it's easier to share immutable data across multiple threads if you're writing some kind of concurrent program, because nobody can go in and make a modification to anyone else's data when they're not allowed to. Right? Uh, and then, since the, you can't mutate the data, you don't need to use locks, so also you avoid deadlocking, which is cool. Um, other things, uh, we get access to old versions of our data structures, right? And that's because to modify an immutable data structure, we create a copy of that data structure which contains the changes that we want, okay? So then we get access to old versions. So there's a, there are a couple of file systems out there which use a, a technique like this. For instance, ZFS uses a, uh, a technique of, it's similar to this immutable style here where it uh, recreates via, it, it modifies via producing copies and then you can keep old copies around as snapshots. Um, that's a sort of practical use of immutability. Um, so let's move on with some examples here. So here's an example of some immutable data. We've got a Scala case class, which is, uh, you could think of this as a, as an, uh, this is an algebraic data type with one data constructor called SUS. So this is similar to a Haskell data definition. Um, and to construct a SUS, you need to pass it a color and an animal. So let's go ahead and construct a SUS. Right, we've constructed a red fish. We call it one fish. And what if we want to uh, modify this piece of immutable data? and make it a bluefish instead, right? Well, we will produce a copy, and we'll do that with Scala's uh, dot copy function here. And so we're saying uh, two fish is what you get when you take one fish and you copy it, replacing the color with blue. Okay, so we've updated that, uh, that piece of data by producing a copy with the changes we wanted. All right, let's move on to a more serious example now, trees. So this is a... This is a, an algebraic data type with two constructors. So the, the name of the algebraic data type is tree, and its two constructors are tip, which, is, which takes no parameters, so it's like a, an empty leaf on the tree, or branch, which has a left subtree, right? a value at this node uh, of type A, and the right subtree. So this A is the type that the tree uh, is parameterized over, so that's like a Java generic. Okay, so this is a tree which stores its data in the nodes rather than in the leaves. And we can have a convenience function here called leaf, uh, which takes an A and constructs a branch with two empty tips and that A in it. Alright, so we can now play around with this data type a little bit. So we can make a tree here called deep, right? And this is the, this is the code that will create that tree, and, and here's a pretty picture of it. Uh, this, this tree happens to be in order, and it happens to be balanced, but that's not necessarily a property that holds for this, this type of tree. That's just so that the example is pretty. Okay, so see this, uh, this, this node down here with a five in it? We want to replace that node, right? Because it said something mean or something like that. 
we want to replace that node. So how are we going to replace that node in this immutable data structure, right? So first we're going to have to walk our way down to that node. And we're going to do that with a pattern match here. So here we're constructing a different tree. And we're constructing it by taking our original tree and pattern matching it apart. Okay, it's a branch with a left subtree, which is this half, a right subtree, which is this half, and an X, which is the, the value of the root node, which is four in this case. Okay, and then we're taking our right subtree, and we're pattern matching that apart into a branch with the left subtree, which is what we're interested in, and then a Y and a, and a right subtree. Okay, so now we're going to construct the, the node that we want to replace this node of five with. So we'll do that by calling the leaf function on the value 20 to produce a, a new node here. But then in order to, uh, we, we need to sort of rebuild our way back up the spine of the tree, right? We'll do that like that. Right. So you see that to replace this 20 deeply nested inside the tree, right? we created a copy of it and then we had to rebuild back up the tree so that the root node of the tree would point to the correct node. Does that make sense to everyone? All right. Okay, so what if we want to replace another node in this tree? Maybe we want to replace that seven. All right. What are we going to do? We'll do pretty much the same thing again. We'll pattern match on the root of the tree, and we'll take our right subtree, and we'll pattern match on that. Okay, and then we'll get the right subtree of that, which is the node of the seven. And then we will construct a new node with a value in it that's better. 42 is better than seven. And then we will rebuild up the spine of the tree. Now we have our new tree, right? We've replaced both of those elements that we care about. And we've done it in a really, really horrible way. Okay, so this is a really horrible thing that we've just done because we've, first of all, we've done these pattern matches and, and they're really ugly looking. And also they're not, they're not total, right? So in neither of these pattern matches are we ma matching the case that the tree is, uh, is a tip, right? What if our data is not shaped the way we expect it to be? Well, because this is a partial pattern match, it'll do something crazy like throw an exception at runtime or some other unspeakably awful thing. So that's one reason why this is particularly terrible. But also, right, we walked all the way from the root of the tree down to the node that we were interested in, replaced it, rebuilt our way all the way back up, and then went all the way back down again to change the other node and then reconstructed our way back up again. Right, so we had to do two full like walks down and up the spine of this tree. Okay, so you can imagine that if this were a really deep tree that were maybe five or six levels deep and we wanted to replace multiple things that were near the bottom of the tree, this would get really expensive really fast. You've already got three of them. Exactly. Right. So, so we're going to come up with something a lot better than this, right? We're going to solve this problem of uh, walking around and manipulating, and walking around inside and manipulating our immutable data, right? In such a way that we're not paying this horrible cost every single time, okay? And so this technique is called uh, a zipper, and it's based on an observation that replacing the root of the tree, you can do in constant time. You can just keep replacing the root of the tree, right? Because there's no more, there's no spine above you that you need to rebuild back up, right? You can just swap out the root node easily. You don't have to, because if we replace like this node, then we have to rebuild this node, and then we have to rebuild this node. But you can always replace the root. Okay. So the key, the key idea behind these, these zipper things, is that. It al they allow you to walk around inside a structure while reorienting it around you, such that you're always at a focus, which is sort of like a pseudo root. You're always at a focus that you can cheaply replace. Right? That's the key idea. Let's see what, what that would look like to use, just with diagrams again, before we jump back into code. We'll jump into code. So here's the same tree. We're going to perform the same modifications we did, but we're going to do it like zipper style. So I'm going to use a blue circle to represent the current focus, okay? And we're going to walk through this tree now. So we're interested in replacing this five and this seven. So we want to walk down into the right subtree. 
So that's what we'll do. So now we're focused on the six. And you can see that walking down to the six, we've actually flipped around this arrow, right? So this used to be an arrow from the four down to the six. But now that the six is the focus, right, we, uh, we now know about the four that's above us rather than it knowing about us. So now we can, uh, we can replace this, right, because, because we're, we're at something that, is, that behaves like the root for what we're concerned about. So let's walk down further and replace that 5. So we'll walk down to the 5. Again, we flip the arrow around. Okay, and now we can replace this 5. So we've replaced it with a 5, but that should be a different number, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> pretend it's a different number. <laughs> it's a different instance of 5. Yeah, it is just a different instance of 5. Um, and, and so now we can, we can walk. We need, to go down, we need to go and replace the 7 now for this particular contract example. So we'll go back up to the 6, and going back up to the 6 has allocated a different node here because we need one that points to what is in fact a 20 on this slide instead of a 5. <laughs> so it just, it's lazy evaluation, all right? It just took a while. <laughs> I have a question about that bit. Yeah. When the focus is the 6, yeah. it's like the 6 is now the root of the tree, right? Uh, sort of? For our purposes, yeah. It's a binary tree, and you now have Three outgoing arrows. Yes, so work? it's... Is there a trick that you'll explain later? Or? Yes, so that's what the, the zipper sort of is. It's a, okay, yeah. it's a separate representation of the same tree that, that, okay, yeah. that behaves the way that we want. Um, so we can walk down to the seven, and that flipped the arrow, so now again, <coughs> all those arrows are pointing away from us, so we can replace very cheaply. Um, and we can replace... Yeah, it's a different number this time! So this time it's a 42, which is what we wanted. Um, and now we can walk back up. So walking back up to the 6 has actually allocated another node there uh, that points to both the 20 and the 42. Uh, and then we can walk back up to the root, which replaces the root. And now we have the tree that we want. Right? So uh, we've avoided a little bit of work going sort of up and down. Um, if we had you you can add lots of extra interesting complexity to zippers to make them uh, so that you could you could have done this if you were really clever you could have done this without allocating two nodes here um, but I don't know how to do that so I won't talk about it in my talk um, but we can see how that's a lot better so let's look at what zippers actually look like in code now or soon we'll look at list zippers which are sort of the the simplest zipper so this allows us to walk, well I hope it's a simple zipper or I should have picked a different example, but it allows us to walk through a list and modify the elements of the list. But it also lets us do some other cool stuff that we'll see. So here's what a list zipper looks like. It is an algebraic data type with one constructor called list zipper, which is parameterized over A. And so this represents a view inside of a list, right? We are, we are focusing on one element of the list, so we're like partway through the list. And then there's a list of the stuff to the left of us, and there's a list of the stuff to the right of us. Okay? And so we can walk around by going further to the right or further to the left. So what would it look like to use a list zipper? So if we have the list one, two, three, four, five, right, then we would be, then if we created a zipper for that list, we would be focused on the one, and then two, three, four, and five would be the list of things to our right. Okay. Yeah. Is two or five the head of the rights list? Ah, so two is the head of the rights list, and I'll I'll focus on that in a few more slides. Yeah. Okay. Excellent question. Um, so uh, let's let's move through our list because that one is just fine. It hasn't done anything mean to us, so we'll leave it alone. Let's walk further to the right, so we can pull the two off the list of rights. So now now that we're focused on the two. The one is to our left, right? That used to be the focus, but now it's to the left of us. Okay, and now we have three, four, and five to the right of us. We can walk further to the right. So we took the two, which was our focus, and put it on top of this stack of lefts, right? So the, the two is to the left of us. Okay? Uh, and so the list of things to the left of us actually ends up reversed. It ends up in the the reverse order to the to the actual list. And the reason is this. 
when we use a when we use a list, we can cons onto the front of the list in constant time. We can just keep on consing things to the front of the list, right? So, and when we're using this zipper here, we want the thing immediately to our left to be readily available, right? So we want the thing immediately to our left to be the head of the list of the things to the left of us, right? And for that to be the case, the list, list of things to the left of us is actually in the reverse order. Okay. Uh, so now that we're at the three, maybe we want to replace the three. We can replace it with 64, which is better than three. Uh, but the other cool thing about list zippers is that, or zippers in general, is that not only can we swap out elements for other elements, but we can modify the structure while we're traversing it. Right? So maybe we can we could insert an element to the right of the current focus. Okay? So we could put in 88 right, between, you know, just to the right of the focus. And we could put in a different number again to the left of the focus. So you see that we can, we can add elements to the list or delete elements from the list as we go through it. Okay. So what, what would this look like now if we turned it back into a list? So to read this diagram, we read up from the bottom of the left because the list is reversed. So this list is 1, 2, 9, 64, and then to the right of us, 88, 4, 5. Okay, so that's what it looks like when we use a list zipper. So we'll go back to some code now. Um, we'll define some of those functions that we just used. Okay, so here's our list zipper type. We're going to define the function put, which replaces the focus with a new value. Okay, so it just constructs a list zipper where the things to our left are the things that were already to our left, the things to our right are the things that are already, already to our right, and we simply replace the focus with this parameter that we're given. Okay? If we want to go left, right, left, uh, we, we get back a, an option of list zipper. So this is like Haskell's maybe data type that Fraze talked about. Okay? It's either it's either none or it's some a, right? And the reason that we get back an option of list zipper when we attempt to move is because there might not be anything to our left, right? If we try to move left and there's nothing there, we sort of fall off the end, okay? The data didn't look how we expected it to look, okay? So how do we define this function? Well, we pattern match on the list of things to the left of us. And if it's an empty list, we get back none, right? We've fallen off the end. But if it's an x comes down to some other list of x's, then we produce a new list zipper and wrap it up in the sum constructor, right? Where the, the list of things to the left of us is the x's, which is the tail of what used to be the things to the left of us. The new focus is the x, which is the head of things that used to be to the left of us. And then we cons what used to be our focus onto the list of things to the right of us. So it's to the right of us now. Okay, so that's how we move left. Moving right looks very similar. Uh, we pattern match on the things to the right of us. If there isn't anything to the right of us, we fall off the edge of the world. Uh, but if there are things to the right of us, then the new focus is the, the head of that list of things. The new things to the right of us are the tail of that list of things. And we cons the focus onto the left. So you see, in both of these cases, we're consing the focus, right? And that's why the list to the left of us ends up in reverse order. It's because we're always consing onto it when we go to the right. And we can turn a list zipper back into a list, right, by reversing the things to the left of us so that they're in the order we want, and then appending those onto the, the list singleton list containing only the focus, and then appending all that onto the list of things to the right of us. Okay? So that's how we go from a list zipper, but what if we have a list and we want to we want to get a list zipper, right? We want to start zippering and inserting elements and doing all sorts of cool stuff. So we're defining a function here called zipper, which takes a list and produces an option of list zipper. Right? It can't give us a list zipper that isn't an optional one. And that's because the uh, in a list zipper we're always focusing on one element. Right. So if we try to create a list zipper from an empty list, we can't do that because there's no element 
for our initial focus. Okay, so that's why uh, the return type here is an option of this zipper. And the implementation is simple. We take our list pattern match on, on it. If the list is nil, we get none. Or if the list is an element x constant or some other x's, we get back some list zipper where the list of things to the left of us is the empty list nil. The focus is the x, which was the head of the list, and the things to the right of us are the rest of the list. So we start from the head of the list. Okay. Now there's a really cool data type that I really want to get the word out about because it's a really cool data type. But Fraser already did the job for me. It's called the non-empty list data type. <laughs> We've got it in Scala 2. Right? But, uh, but you have to import Scala Z, which you should be doing anyway in every Scala <laughs> module you ever write. And if you get a compiler warning saying you imported Scala Z but you didn't use it, use it. <laughs> <laughs> And so when we have a non-empty list, we can always construct a list zipper because there's always something we can focus on. So it's a list zipper with nothing to the left of us, the head of the list for the focus, and the tail of the list to the right of us. So we've seen a list zipper, but, but who actually uses these list things? Like, what are they seriously used for? And I'll tell you what they're seriously used for. There is an amazingly cool program called Xmonad, which is a tiling window manager for X11, and it is a Haskell program which uses zippers like right at the core of it. It's got a really cool zipper data type. So uh, most people are familiar with, I think they're called floating window managers, where you, you can drag your windows around however you want and you can resize them. <laughs> a tiling window manager lays your windows out for you based on a tiling algorithm, and then you can rotate your windows around and, and uh, move between workspaces. So you can sort of see how this lends itself to a zipper, right? We've got one window that we're focusing on, and then we've got a bunch of other windows around it, and then we have multiple different workspaces we can swap between. It's just a big zipper, right? And that's really cool. <laughs> Xmonad is a great Haskell program to show to people who say that you can't write Haskell programs that do effects. What's more effectful than moving a window around on the screen, right? Probably nothing. <laughs> <laughs> What happens to the zipper if you have more than one monitor? Uh, it, you get one workspace per monitor. So does it have two for pair? Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. no, there's only one. Oh, there's only one in focus. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. The two X screens would be two foci. Yeah, right. Yeah, so you're only ever, like, you only <laughs> ever have one different. workspace selected. So you yeah. have two workspaces on your two monitors and then yeah. And then you zip between your workspaces. Exactly, you do. Um, <laughs> it's a really cool program. I encourage you to go and look at its source code because it's it's cool. Um, it's only twelve hundred lines or something. Like that. Exactly, exactly. There's a tiling window manager written in C, which is called DWM, and the the creators of DWM are very proud. They like to say, "Aha! Our program is so simple. It's only two thousand lines of C." But Xmonad is only 1,200 lines of Haskell. So if you care about some crazy metric like lines of code, <laughs> this is better. <laughs> Ignoring the fact that your config files are probably 200 lines of Haskell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing. It's configured in Haskell, which is great. Uh, and the other thing I know of that uses zippers is a library called Argonaut, which is a really, really fast, really cool JSON library for Scala. Uh, and we're going to look at some examples of the Argonaut library today to sort of get a feeling for what more serious zippers might look like. So let's refresh ourselves on what, ja on what JSON is. So everybody loves JavaScript. We all know that. Yay. We can all stop talking about it. <laughs> Um, and since we all love JavaScript so much, what we should do is make all of our data look like JavaScript, and then if the mean boss comes in and says, you have to write Haskell today, at least we can like use JSON for our data, and then we can think back to how wonderful JavaScript is. <laughs> if there were a sarcasm detector in the room, it would have exploded. <laughs> uh, so here's an example of a... Of a of a JSON object, right? So it's a, we see that a JSON object is a collection of key value pairs where the, the keys are strings and the values can be all sorts of things. They can be numbers, 
They can be arrays of other JSON things. They can be nulls. Um, they can be strings. They can be booleans. Um, they can be strings with the word false in them because you love debugging. Uh, and we can nest JSON objects within themselves, right? So the value for, a, for a, one of these key value pairs could be a JSON object. Okay, so we see that there are two ways to nest JSON inside of itself, right? We can nest it in an array or we can nest it in an object. So this is a big tree, right? And the first example I used was trees. So we could probably use zippers for this. But first we'll have to see how does Argonaut represent JSON as a data type in memory, right? Because strings are completely useless. So we'll look at the JSON representation here. So it's an algebraic data type called JSON. It has all these constructors. So it has a constructor corresponding to each thing you just saw. There's a, there's a nullary constructor here called jnull uh, for the null value in JSON. There's the jbool constructor, which is for Boolean values. There's a jnumber constructor, which takes a JSON number. Uh, a JSON number is a really cool thing which stays as precise as it can be. So if you have a, I think the, the standard says something crazy like all the numbers are floating point or something awful like that. But this, this number type is a bit cleverer. And uh, if, you, if your value is an int, it will remember, oh, actually, that's an int, which is really handy. Um, we won't get into that any further. It could be a JSON string. Right? It could be an array, a, a JSON array in this case, or it could be a JSON object. Okay. So this is the definition for a JSON array. It's just a list of JSON values. I won't show you the definition of JSON object because it's uh, big and, and complicated. But it's basically a, a map from string to JSON. Okay. It has all sorts of extra, extra little fancy bits in there, like it knows about ordering and that kind of thing. But you could, for the purposes of this talk, you can think of it as a map from string to JSON. Okay, what would a zipper for that data type look like? Well, we're going to have three constructors. The first constructor is for the root of the JSON uh, object, right? So that's this CJSON uh, constructor here. Oh, Argonaut calls it zippers curses, but they, they mean the same thing. Uh, so that's for when we're at the root. And if we're not at the root of the JSON structure, where are we? Well, we're either partway through an array or we're partway through an object. Right? Because those are the two ways that we can nest JSON inside of itself. So if we're partway through an array, where this data constructor, uh, so this is this has some extra stuff, but it looks a lot like our list zipper, right? There's a list. If we're in the middle of an array, there's a JSON that we're focusing on, and there's a list of stuff to the left of us in the array, and a list of stuff to the right of us in the array. Uh, there's also this P and this U here, which I'll talk about in a moment. And if we're not in the middle of an array, and we're not at the root, we must be in the middle of an object. Okay? So that is the C object constructor for our zipper type. Okay? And so we have a key value pair that we're currently focusing on. Uh, we have an O, which is the rest of the JSON object. And we have this, this P and this U here again. So what are they for? Well, this Boolean U actually keeps track of whether you've updated the data structure. Right, so if you walk down deep into a data structure and examine some data, but you don't actually touch anything while you're there, there's no reason you should reallocate to build your way back up when you could just go back up to the top. Right? If you haven't changed anything, you don't need to rebuild the spine. So this Boolean here keeps track of whether you have changed anything. And then this, uh, this P here, this cursor P, is actually the cursor of the, the parent, the thing above us. Right. So it's very quick. If we haven't updated anything and we want to go up a level, we simply return that cursor and we're done. Right. That's really cool and that's part of why this goes so fast. Okay, so that's our zipper data type. Those are the three constructors. All right, let's see what it looks like to use that to get a better feel for it. Oh, and so the, the blue things here are the foci, the, the JSONs inside of each of them. Oh, and we can't go through the example until we define functions. Sorry. Um, let's define functions. So if we if we can always set the JSON at our current at our current focus with the set function, 
we can go down into a JSON field, right? So this is saying, if we're at an object, we can, we can give it a key and say, give me the value for this key, all right? And so that's what this down field function does. Uh, if we're in an array, we can go left or we can go right. So these are just some of the basic traversal functions for our JSON zipper. Right? And there are many more. There's lots of cool stuff we can do with the JSON zipper, and I don't have time to show you like three quarters of it tonight. But these are the things we'll use. So now let's go back to our example JSON here. So we've got our, you know, we've got our key value pairs here, we've got our array, we've got some bools, that's all cool. But I really don't like this array. And the reason I don't like it is because it has the string four in it when it should probably, hopefully, have the number four instead. And it has a null here, and I don't like null, so I want to replace that with five. Right? These are my examples. I can do what I want. Um, so we're going to use our zipper right, to walk through this, this JSON data structure here and replace those. We're going to replace that string four with the number four, and we're going to replace that null with five. So uh, I'm going to color blue the thing which we are focusing on with our zipper. So if we start with our JSON and we say JSON.cursor to get the zipper, right, we're focusing on the whole thing. So at the moment, the whole thing's blue. Now let's uh, go down to the my array field, mm -hmm. right? Because the elements that we want to modify are inside that, inside that uh, field. So now we're going to go down into the field of this object called my array. So there is a field called my array, and its value is this array. Okay? So we've walked down to the field. We're using a Scala 4 comprehension because these operations return options. Uh, and so once we're now, once we're down to the array, we can say, uh, well, once we're focusing on the entire array, we can say, the thing here is an array, and now I want to start walking through it. So that's what the down array does. Okay, and now when we start uh, zippering our way through the array, we start at the first element. But we want to walk our way over to the four, so we can go right. And now we're focused on the two. We can go right again, focus on the three, and we can go right once again. And now we're focused on the string four. <laughs> now we'll replace it with the number four, so that's our set four. Now we'll go to the right again. Now we're focused on the null. We can replace the null, and then we can call a function called undo, which says I'm done being a zipper now. I would like to reconstruct my way back up. So we call undo. And now we have a JSON once again, but we have our array looks much prettier. Okay, so that's what it kind of looks like to use a zipper, right? Imagine how awful this would have looked if we'd used pattern matching or something like that. It'd be unbelievable. It'd be like we'd, we'd pattern match our way in and say, oh, if this thing's an array, it'd just be awful. But it, we've, we managed to do it in this much code, and I think that's pretty cool. Uh, what have we seen tonight? Right? We've seen that zippers let us walk around and manipulate data structures. And we can do it possibly faster, uh, usually safer, and definitely prettier than with pattern matches. What have we not seen? Well, there's lots more to zippers. There's an entire ocean, an entire universe of, of zipper theory out there. Um, there are actually, that says kinds, but it should say types. There are actually three different types of zippers in Argonaut. So I only really showed you one of the types of zippers in Argonaut, right? So if there are three times that many zippers in Argonaut, imagine how many there are not in Argonaut. <laughs> and it turns out that every zipper gives rise to a comonad or something like that. And Dave can tell you all about that, but I can't. And so we haven't seen that tonight. And that's the end of the talk. One thing that struck me as potentially like not very pretty, um, deletion. Yeah, it okay. looks like it's kind of horrible because you'd have to say, well, I can't delete the point I'm on because I'm not allowed to have a null focus. And the one, I can't take it off the stack to my left because, well, that could be empty. And I can't take it off the stack to my right. So I have no consistent way. And what if I'm in a singleton zipper, right? What happens if you try to delete? Is, is there, there so, must be a standard way to do it. So there are, there are different ways to do it. Uh, in the example of a list zipper, yeah. you would have to say either delete and then take me to the right, 
or delete and then take me to the left. Yeah. Uh, in order and to get a new focus. Trends. And then it would be an optional because there might not be something to your left. So what if you're nested inside a structure like, like you're in the middle of your um, JSON, right, and you delete something that was a singleton, like, like an array with one element in it, does that cause everything to detonate? Or? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but I would imagine if we were in an array and it were a singleton array and we deleted the element, then we would we would delete it and go to the parent, and then the parent would contain an empty array. Yeah. Okay. So you have to sort of say, you have to sort of know ahead of time, after I delete, I want to go here. Yeah. The singletons, because there's no such thing as an empty zipper, seem to be this, this terrible edge case. That's the way to do yeah, it. you just have to say where you're going after you delete. I've seen implementations that have a deleted boolean, so when you start moving around, the deleted nodes get vanished. Oh, okay. oh that's cool. Yeah. Right. Are there any other questions? Yep. Um, the CJSON constructor for cursor? Yes. What is the point of that? What, what does that actually give you? Uh, because if you have... The root, JSON. Where you, the root where you're not sure whether it's an array or an object, because the top level thing could be. So yeah, a valid, one. a valid um, JSON value could be the number four, <coughs> and so if we were to represent. Yeah, that, what's the what's the point of having the cursor for that? Because wouldn't if you had the number four, you would wouldn't you be. Four doesn't have the segment. You might have a parent thing, but cursor. Four doesn't. doesn't. Cursor. Cursor gives you your zipper API. Yeah, but I guess I, I don't understand what's the point of actually focusing on the four as a C JSON rather than focusing on the four as a four that is in a map or a list, or in an array or a list. It might not be in one. Yeah. It's complete then. All JSON well, how, how, be represented. how would it not be complete? Because J, a JSON object well, like, in what context? In what context would a four exist? When it's um, not a JSON object. Hey. When it's a JSON value. Yeah. If you just have the string four, you can read it as JSON and it's the JSON value four. Well, actually, that's not correct because it depends on which spec you read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, a JSON. Yeah, it has to be either an object or a list according to the RFC. Mm -hmm. and that's only one. If you focus on the element, element you know, in the least, that's when you'd be focused on the JSON as well. Yeah. I guess, I guess I just don't understand what's the point of actually going down onto something that isn't an array or a list. Because you can't go any, you can't go any further okay. and you should be able to replace the four with it at the focus of, a, of an object or a, uh, or a list. I guess so. It could be for that, that top level case where we choose a different standard. Yeah, okay. Well, there's plenty of real world cases of that so I guess it's something that a library has to handle. Scale is a special case, but okay, we can zip in either direction, but it still exists. Mm. Cool. Are there any other questions? Um, yeah, so your example is usually follow the traverse around some structure according to the underlying structure of the original thing, so you're following the arrows that already exist. But um, I ask this because I'm pretty sure I've used a zipper that traversed it sort of orthogonally, like going across a level of a tree. Okay. Am, I just, am I remembering that completely wrong, or are there, or is there some other way to implement zippers where this analogy of keeping track of where you've gone kind of breaks down, and you're essentially just building on a new structure? Uh, yeah, you could do that. To, okay. to the best of my knowledge, you could have a, a zipper that that you you could walk through levels of the tree rather than sort of I have to go the arrows that the tree already has. So would that be a fundamentally different implementation of a zipper that creates a new structure for the underlying thing that you had? Or is that kind of what's going on in the background of this as well? I think if I understand the question correctly, that's what's going on in the background of this. Well, if you think about a simple case like the binary tree, when you add a node and you go down either to the left or the right, it's zero cost to, or it's constant, constant cost to obtain a pointer to both of the children, and then you can add that as a parameter to the constructor for the cursor at the left or the right so that you can imbibe it with the knowledge of its sibling to the left or the right. So that's a simple case. Um, 
for a rose tree, uh, um, you know, it probably gets more complicated and you might end up having to actually traverse child structures, which might not be a constant time cost. You could do a traversal continuation as you left and right. Uh, let's say you're trying to move around a, a matrix. You know, that way, going between columns, you might have it in you know, column uh, minor order or something like that. And then you could be, rather than moving up and down, you could basically just change the, um, the order in which you try to describe it. Yeah, so, but if, you, if you've got a list of list implementations yeah. and you know you're, you know, three positions down the list and you have a pointer then, to the list beside you, then you'd need to go three positions down to get a pointer to the right or to the left. But if you're keeping track of, like, how did I get here, right, you could just edit the number you have left three times down twice, right? You could then, you could do manipulations on just the path that I took to get here to actually, like, move back and forth along the, the columns rather than the rows. I can imagine something like that, which is sounds like what she was describing. You, you know why we're doing the thing where you think, oh, I'm just only talking things that are local to me. Now you'd be manipulating the history that you got here for, and you wouldn't be doing just, just the tip. You'd be using that in order to pop directly across rows, even though they're not local in the way you've stored them. That's sort of, like, could you do that? Yeah, you could. You could do that, but then you'd incur, you'd incur the cost of doing that read yeah, to actually it, it, get to the... Related yeah. But if you if you're only manipulating just that that little list of in my case like two to the left three down something like that you can just be manipulating just that list rather than traversing through the rest of it. Yeah. So if you're, like, if you're going to represent to hijack. A, if you're going to represent a, a matrix, you could represent it by a vector. Yeah. Right. And then if you if you know it's a three by four matrix, you can have a twelve length vector, and then you can you can make yeah. sure that you yeah. you know which one is is which yeah. column or whatever. No, and then you could construct a zipper where you could walk diagonally or in any which way you wanted yeah. Yeah. That, that operated on that vector. So yeah, that, that's actually efficient way to do Yeah, and that would be more efficient, right, than, than modifying the vector if it were an immutable vector, because you would produce yeah. a copy for each element. So if you wanted to change three, you would be producing three, like three by four vectors. Yeah. What are the other cursors in Agro? There is a... Um, as far as I remember, there is a cursor which uh, keeps track of failure within itself so that you don't have to use option to, to move around. And then there's a really cool one which builds on that, which is a history cursor, which keeps a history of where you have tried to go. And then if you fail, so if you fall off the left of your array or you try to walk into a key value pair where the key value pair doesn't exist, right? what you get back is a really cool error that's not a string that says you tried to go down into an object and you did, and then you tried to go into an array and that's cool, and then you went three to the right, but you fell off the array because there were only two things in it. And you, so you get these really cool histories that you can then go back and examine, and you get uh, this cool, like, efficient backtracking that goes on. If you say, I want to go here or go here, right? If you go down here twice and then fail, then it can keep track of that and then successfully go and do this thing and then later on tell you, I couldn't do this thing because it failed down here. They're very cool. Do you, do you use Argonaut at work? I do, yeah. yep. I use Argonaut at work all the time. Um, Argonaut was originally conceived at EFOX by Mark Hibbert and Tony Morris and Dylan Just. Um, Dylan's famous around the office for coming up with the name. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we still use Argonaut there. We, um, we're using the, the open source version now, so we've stopped developing our internal one. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.